This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, this is Tisha Manteith with the Neurology Podcast. Welcome to our 2025 Headache Series. Our first headache program is called the Best of Headache Medicine in 2024. With me to discuss is Patricia Pozorosic, who is the Director of Headache and Cranial Facial Pain Clinical Unit, as well as the Migraine Adaptive Brain Center at the Val de Bron University Hospital in Barcelona, Spain. Patricia, thank you for being here. How are you? Fine. Thank you, Tisha. What for you is some of the best research that was published in 2024? I think I'll highlight five different topics. For me, number one was a concept that we have been learning through different real-world studies or phase four studies that early treatment in migraine prevention is very important, which means that really we are doing things too late and that uh, we should be starting prevention in our migraine patients earlier within the disease evolution, within even the attack, in migraine that we already understood a while ago, we have to treat attacks as more or less as soon as pain, mild pain starts. And hopefully maybe in the future, we might be able to treat prodromal symptoms too. But I think we have not yet understood or we are not implementing correctly the fact that prevention should start earlier. And that is very much linked to a better disease and treatment outcome. I love that comment because there's this kind of debate to whether migraine is a progressive disorder and maybe for some patients it is, but either way, starting prevention early improves outcomes. Yeah, I think that's super important and we will have to get used to the idea because I'm convinced that more and more evidence will pour out in different research projects, papers and scientific evidence that will change our way of, of treating the disease. Yeah. In regards to the fact that early prevention is important, I think there are two important papers that were published during 2024. One was the APRAISE trial. This was a phase four multicentric trial published in JAMA Neurology at the beginning of 2024. And the other one is this real world also study done in several European countries that included almost 6,000 patients. We called it the Eureka Project, the Eureka Consortium. And also with all of this real world data, we, f we realized that those patients who got to start treatment when the disease was not as uh, severe uh, responded much better and had better treatment outcomes. This second paper, by the way, was published in JNNP. Number two, I think PACAP is the next big topic in headache. And this 2024, there was a, an important paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that in a phase two trial, which is the acronym for peptide protein that gets released during migraine attacks. So by blocking or controlling PACAP, there was a clinical benefit for patients in a preventive way too. And so hopefully you know, all of this clinical research development will go into phase three trials and that might lead to a new therapeutic target for migraine. So I think that is something which hopefully was relevant in 2024, hopefully will be relevant for our patients in the future. Yeah, we had Masood Ashina come on and discuss that study that was published in New England Journal of Medicine. And so our listeners can go back and review that podcast for sure. That is a really exciting paper. Number three for me would be all of the hormonal research that is starting to happen in migraine, as well as I think in many other diseases. So we are starting to find out that maybe there are different types of responses, depending on your hormonal status, on whether if you are male or female, of course, but also different probably age groups within your sex. So I think that all of the information that has started in 2024, there are no clinical direct implications, but I do think that making this step forward in research will probably have some future implications on how we treat our patients. For now, there is no direct, I was, as I was saying, clinical implications. You have to treat the same way males and females and whatever age group you're in front of, you could say. 
yeah, the male female differences, I think we need bigger studies to really separate that out. But when we think about hormonal and non-hormonal, some of the, the translational research showing the interaction between CGRP and estrogen. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is really cool stuff. Yeah, I think we are starting. It doesn't have a direct clinical implication, but I do think that we will have to be conscious and aware of that for the future. What else then? I would say number four, probably in my mind, is new research that is coming out showing certain enzymes which actually accelerate or potentiate in the, cannabinoid, the endocannabinoid system might also be useful maybe in the future for pain in general, I imagine, but studies here were done specifically with migraine. So I do believe that maybe we also have something that might be useful, a new different therapeutic option for our patients in the future. Yeah, it's interesting to start thinking beyond CGRP receptors. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, with CGRP, I think that uh, we will keep on finding out things which are very interesting. Actually, we published a couple of papers measuring CGRP in saliva samples of our patients. And what we saw was that some patients had CGRP in their saliva during attacks, others didn't. And we call this CGRP dependent or independent attacks. And we further went on and saw this was a paper published last year where we actually saw that this evidence was stronger with more numbers, you would say. So clearly migraine is not only a CGRP disease. And even within one patient, you can have CGRP attacks that aren't. Maybe that's why we are seeing differences in response to prevention and acute treatment with anti-CGRP therapies. That's interesting as a concept too. So I know there's been some papers on predictors of who's going to respond to CGRP therapies. What's new in that area? We have been, as you're saying, migraine still lacks of validated biomarkers. For me, this is the next frontier. We will, and we are working on this, and we will uh, eventually find them. They are not that far away in my mind, the biomarkers that probably will be useful for migraine in general as a diagnostic concept and as a maybe therapeutic predictor, as you are asking me now. But for now, we have to work with certain biomarkers, you could call them. So in a clinical level, different studies have found different things. In my mind, the one that I was just mentioning, which is late, arriving late to treatment is probably the most validated one right now. And we've also seen that those patients who are or have more comorbidities, especially those related to depression and anxiety, also might be less responsive sometimes to anti-CGRP therapies or where anti-CGRP therapies are only partially effective. We are seeing that there are certain things that might hinder you know, the response to anti-CGRP therapies. But really, I, I don't think we could say that in a validated way we have a clinical predictor of response. And then there are other studies that are have been done in smaller groups of patients where we have seen that those patients who respond or do not respond sometimes have different structural changes in the brain. So these are neuroanatomical and neurofunctional studies that show sometimes that for example, the presence of certain iron deposits, and this study was done by the Todd Schwedt group from the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale. I think, I believe it was published in Cephalalgia. They showed that those patients who had more iron deposits in their, I think it was frontal cortex, periaqueductal gray matter, actually responded worse to anti-CGRP therapies, for example. We think that that might be linked to more permanent damage, you would say, of the brain after probably having a very chronic developed disease. So let's talk about some other errors outside of migraine that was pivotal. We have many other types of headaches, and indeed, sometimes we wish there would be a bit more research done there. But for now, we can comment that we have the cluster headache guidelines that will probably help improve, I would say, quality and excellence of care. So that's already something new to talk about in that regard. For example, by the way, we published last year a protocol for treating headache in the emergency room. We called it the code headache. This was published in the European Journal of Neurology. And uh, I think that's of interest for many neurologists who are actually doing calls and uh, treating patients in the emergency room, for example. Thanks for that, because we're just working on our QI for ED management of headaches. So I will look up the reference after this. We have been implementing it now for a year and a half, I would say, a couple of years. And our patients at least are happier. 
So now we are analyzing the data. So why don't we talk a little bit more practically to help our neurologists out that are listening to this podcast in our routine clinical encounters. Let's talk a little bit about patient reported outcomes and the best ways, most efficient ways to assess patients' response to treatment. We were saying before, we don't have diagnostic tests. We don't have biomarkers that we can measure. I always compare what I'm trying to refer to to glucose. We don't have a level that helps us balance out our treatments or decide doses of our treatments and so on. So we have been using patient-reported outcomes. Among them, I would include even headache diaries to try and capture and collect what is happening with our patients to try and make the best decisions for our patients in regards to what to recommend them, offer them, and so on. And uh, actually, after having used a lot of these different PROs, we call them patient-reported outcomes, each of them focused in different aspects of the disease and the impact that the disease has in in our patients, we have realized that at a practical level to try and decide which treatment is working for our patients, probably PGI, so this is a patient global impact of change scale, is probably the most convenient one. And actually, if, if you're all familiar with it, it's such a simple scale that just says, are you much better? Are you better? Are you just the same, worse? So it's a very simple scale that actually is probably what we all do as physicians when a patient comes in. And that scale is really well correlated with patient satisfaction, patient willingness to continue with treatment, which I think is a summary of all of the other PROs together, which means that the patient actually has improved either, maybe in everything, but either in frequency or in the severity of pain or the presence of other bothersome or disabling symptoms, or actually anything that actually makes this patient want to continue with treatment. I highly recommend you to just keep on doing the work that you and we have all done as physicians, which just listen to your patient and ask them how they feel. I love that paper, and I do ask patients that, and I document it religiously as like the second sentence of every encounter. And now I have proof so that my fellows don't think I'm so compulsive about those very simple questions. Yeah, it's too simple to be true almost, yeah. Yeah, so why don't we talk big data, digital health, AI, and just using these technologies to Mm. better for research purposes, but also really just for the clinical encounter. I think that AI will make us better physicians when it is all properly fed with the data that we we have. It will allow us to really uh, be personal with that patient. So the famous personalized and precision medicine come together. Why do I think that? Because we will have information from every sociodemographic clinical aspect of that patient. This means any comorbidities, as I was saying actually understanding what it means to have a certain age, to have a certain sex. So if you're a female and you are 40 years old, it's probably different than if you are a male and are 70. And that already creates a big difference. So we will cluster patients when we understand not only this, but their comorbidities, other treatments of their own, and previous experiences already with our drugs, and maybe in the future include certain very specific biomarkers, maybe MRI biomarkers or molecular biomarkers. Who knows? In order to have all of this information, we have to create the databases. We still have to create all of what nowadays is called data lakes so that we can actually start understanding which of this information is going to be the most valuable for our patient and at that time point, that disease or moment. So we will see. I think we are still a bit far away from implementation, but we are certainly starting to work in that direction. Why don't you just wrap up the theme of 2024 and what you foresee for 2025? I think 2024 was an exciting moment to start really understanding the impact that anti-CGRP therapies are having in our patients, how they are changing the practice that we are doing in our everyday lives. It has been a clear revolution that has helped us provide 
better and better for me is safer, more efficient therapies for patients. And now being a, a headache specialist or a headache doctor has become easier thanks to these type of therapies, which are well tolerated create high adherence amongst patients. And actually, not for everyone, but for many, are very, very effective. So I think it has been a year of consolidation, I would say, and a year of hope because we are seeing that there might be new therapeutic targets um, in the horizon. Hopefully, some of the ones that are being currently trialed or tested in different phases of clinical development will eventually achieve the purpose of offering different options, safe, efficient options for our patients in the future. I would say it's a year of consolidation and hope at the same time. Thank you for being here. It would be really great to have you back here in 2026 to reflect on all of the progress in 2025 and to see if some of your predictions came through. Yeah, that will be fun. I would love to share that moment with you again. Thank you so much, Patricia. This has been a really outstanding conversation. I'm really excited about all the research we've discussed and what the future is for headache medicine. And thank you so much for listening to our neurology podcast. Be sure to check out the rest of the headache series. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the neurology podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.